A Westminster drama of the most breathtaking kind. A leader unwilling to go, a party and parliament determined to force him out. And today Boris Johnson finally gave in, but when he leaves Downing Street is still uncertain. I'm Dermot Menahan, live in Downing Street with a special programme, Downfall of a Prime Minister. Polarising and pugnacious right to the end, but Boris Johnson finally admits it is over. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. As his wife, daughter, aides and MPs watch on, he applauds his achievements and addresses his supporters. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. So Boris Johnson will go, but not yet, meeting his latest cabinet and pledging to wait until a successor is chosen. Well, over the next hour, we'll hear what politicians and the general public make of that and hear their reaction to his fall. From that red bus to get Brexit done, there's no doubting Boris Johnson's impact, though many question the way he did it. A liar, a showman, a buffoon, a rank incompetent, and probably the most shameful prime minister that Britain has ever had. And the battle to be next, Wallace, Sunak, Truss and the rest. Though we may have to wait until the autumn. A very good evening from Downing Street, where Boris Johnson's downfall was finally confirmed today. The Prime Minister resigned, though he isn't going quietly. He blamed the herd among MPs for forcing him out and said he would stay in place until a successor is chosen. Well, many at Westminster are now trying to make that happen as quickly as possible. The vying to take over has already begun, while others join the Prime Minister's again reshuffled cabinet. Well, tonight we'll look at the Johnson legacy, the parts of the country that he helped his party win for the first time, and hear some of the international reaction to his demise. But first, our political editor, Beth Rigby, reports on the day that saw a Prime Minister's downfall. Still a spring in his step, but this now the end of the road for Boris Johnson. His wife and other die-hard supporters in full applause still. But it couldn't mask the mood. These MPs comforting each other as they came to witness something they fought hard not to see, as did he. But after days of defiance, the Prime Minister now reluctantly relenting. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. And I've agreed with Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of our backbench MPs, that the process of choosing that new leader should begin now. Accepting new leadership now necessary, but first a pointed reminder of what this leader achieved. Thank you for that incredible mandate, the biggest Conservative majority since 1987, the biggest share of the vote since 1979. And making it very clear to the public that he neither wanted nor, in his mind, deserved to go. In the last few days, I've tried to persuade my colleagues that it would be eccentric to change governments when we're delivering so much. I regret uh, not to have been successful in those arguments. And, of course, it's painful not to be able to see through so many ideas and, and projects myself. But as we've seen uh, at Westminster, uh, the herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. And, my friends, in politics, no one is remotely indispensable. Acknowledging then he couldn't carry on, but Mr Johnson true to himself until the very end. No remorse and no mention even that this was a resignation. What he did offer up was regret. I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. Even if things can sometimes seem dark now, our future together 
is golden. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And with that, the Johnson era drew to a close, turning his back on a bruising period. Outside the Downing Street gates, chants of liar and a sense of fury. But it was dissent on the inside that caused his downfall, an avalanche of resignation letters triggered by previously loyal MPs. Even the new Chancellor Nadeem Zahawi not resigning, but urging Boris Johnson to go. From the very top to the bottom, staunch allies call in time. When I made that decision to resign as a parliamentary private secretary, which I appreciate is at the very bottom of the, uh, the ladder in terms of ministerial roles, uh, I, I knew that once I made that decision, that it was the right decision. I haven't regretted it once. I'm just sad that it came to this because I think he is, as I say, a good person instinctively. And I think that he could have been and should have been a great prime minister. But sadly, just some poor choices uh, over too long a time. It just meant that his position was untenable. But the business of running the country goes on, the Prime Minister appointing a new cabinet, yet even those in post wondering what comes next. But clear of one thing, policy decisions are now out of the Prime Minister's hands. Here's the thing, this is a caretaker government. It's not the business of this Prime Minister to start announcing new policies or taking government into a different direction. It's his business to manage a transition in an orderly way and through that process actually redeem some of the ground that he clearly lost yesterday when he uh, stubbornly refused to resign. So he's an administrator rather than a leader at this point? Well, I think he has to be. But that task now so difficult, department after department deserted. I just worry that he isn't going to be able to bring the stability that we need. I, he's got a Chancellor who's already said he doesn't have any confidence in him and two or three other members of the Cabinet. The Attorney General is outwardly campaigning for his job. It's, a, it's just not a credible way to form a government. Boris Johnson will always be remembered as the politician that brought Brexit to Great Britain. At his height, he was the most successful Conservative Party leader at the ballot box since the days of Margaret Thatcher. He won a huge mandate and had it in his gift to lead this country for a decade or more. That was the plan, but it didn't turn out like that. Instead, he finds himself leaving office and as one of the shortest serving prime ministers in the history of his country, a man who in the end let his party and his people down. A politician who is as talented and charismatic as he is flawed and destructive. In the end, it was Boris Johnson who brought himself down. And even on the way out, the opposition trying to hasten his departure. They've declared him unfit to be Prime Minister. They can't inflict him on the country for the next few months. If they don't get rid of him, we will bring that vote of no confidence uh, in the national interest because we can't go on with this broken government led by this discredited Prime Minister. Westminster left reeling after the most extraordinary 48 hours in recent British political history. This a dramatic end to a dramatic premiership. Boris Johnson as defiant in giving up power as he was in taking it. And a politician who will always be remembered, if not always, for the right reasons. And Beth's here with me right now, live in Downing Street. And Beth, uh, you were there six and a half hours ago or so when the Prime Minister made that speech. And I want to ask you what that tells us about the, the tussle, the battle to actually get him out, because he talked about unrelenting sledging, a herd mentality, how it would be eccentric to change governments. He clearly still thinks he really shouldn't be going. I think that that speech was sort of vintage Boris Johnson in the sense that he, to the very end, to the final speech of his premiership in any meaningful sense, uh, he uh, admitted no remorse. Uh, he was unapologetic, really, about what had happened and really put the blame, if you like, onto others, making it clear in that speech uh, that he had not wanted to go, that he had been forced out. Uh, what it had, though, was a tinge of sadness, I thought. There was regret there, regret that he was having to give up the best job in the world, as he put it. But it was clear in that speech uh, that Boris Johnson uh, didn't want to step down, that he had that mandate from the public that he felt had earned him the right to see out his term. But if you step back from these extraordinary events, it is 
genuinely mind-blowing to me that this man, who was so effective in 2019, you and I were there when the results came in. We were covering uh, the election for Sky News and both of us thought he might win, but did we predict an 80-seat majority and the total trouncing of the Labour Party? No, we did not. And so he had this mandate to sort of reshape Great Britain, to perhaps serve two terms, maybe even three. He had in his grasp the chance of being the most prominent and influential post-war prime minister and he squandered it well, and those he's assessments thrown it will, away. will obviously continue for quite some time to the here and now about who's going to replace him mm. he seems to think he may last the mm. summer out mm. and it may take until the autumn mm. there are others in the party who say we've got to get this done very quickly indeed yeah I, I was talking to Robert Buckland you saw him in that piece there now the Welsh secretary and I said to him number one can Boris Johnson actually stay on until September or October a and Robert Buckland said to me to be frank with you I don't know in that there are moves within the party uh, to try and put a caretaker prime minister in but the point of that is they would have to get the cabinet uh, to dissent once more and push him out and I thought what was interesting and I want to read this to you is the way in which they have shifted so rapidly from Boris Johnson being in office but in no sense at all now being in power in any meaningful way and at the cabinet meeting at 3 p.m. the statement here is that the prime minister made it clear the government would not seek to implement new policies or make major changes of direction he said major fiscal decisions should be left for the next prime minister so that was the deal with the cabinet people saying to him we will stay on and serve you know the, the country needs a chancellor it needs a health secretary and so on uh, on the basis that you make no serious policy decisions between now and then so he is if you like an administrator rather than a leader and i think that that might be enough to assuage at least the cabinet from kicking him out and then I guess the next question, Dermot, is uh, how quickly does this happen and who replaces him? A couple of quick thoughts on that. In terms of the timetable, uh, I think there's a move now for the 22 backbench committee to try and kick this off really quickly, perhaps even get to the final two candidates before recess on July the 21st. Like, to do that is going to be a race. That They might make it quite a high threshold of supporters that you need to formally launch a bid. When it's Theresa May, you needed six backers. It might be that they make it 10, okay. 15, even 20. Could have a new Prime Minister by September. OK, Beth. Thank you very much indeed, Beth Ruby, our political editor. Well, if Boris Johnson uh, is removed fairly soon. His will be the shortest-lived Conservative Premiership since Neville Chamberlain, who, of course, was replaced by Winston Churchill. Now, Mr Johnson wants to stay on, though, until a successor is chosen rather than give way to a caretaker leader, as we've been discussing, like his deputy, Dominic Raab. But whatever happens, the process to replace him is now underway, right now. And let's take you through how it works. As things stand, the Prime Minister can approach the Queen at any time to request that she appoint someone else as interim leader. But at the moment, Boris Johnson is staying as a caretaker Prime Minister until a new one is chosen. To take part in the race, a Conservative MP needs to be nominated by eight colleagues. Then, all Conservative MPs vote in a series of rounds, whittling the list of candidates down. The person who receives the fewest votes in each round is eliminated. Voting then continues until only two candidates remain, and then that's the end of the MP's role. Then party members get to make their final choice before a deadline set by the 1922 Committee of Conservative Backbenchers. And then a new Prime Minister is installed. It's thought the current plan is for this to happen, as Beth was telling us, at least by the time of the Conservative Party conference that starts at the beginning of October. There is disquiet, though, over how long all that might take for the next Prime Minister to be chosen, as our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates reports. Boris Johnson standing down, but not leaving. Still in office, he says, for weeks to come until a new leader walks through the number 10 door. MPs are worrying if they can wait that long. In the last 48 hours, his refusal to accept reality has done a lot of damage um, to trust in the institution as a whole, in, in, in Parliament, in, in the conventions that we have in the Conservative Party. He has lost the confidence of the party, that's absolutely apparent, and therefore it's not appropriate that we have anything other than a proper caretaker administration. 
A new cabinet is in place, promising no surprises in the coming weeks. A bare-bones government facing so many crises. The biggest war in Europe for decades, skyrocketing bills stalling the economy, and a health service battling a crippling COVID backlog, all pushing the Conservative Party to move at speed. You could have the hustings over the next couple of weeks. The House rises in two weeks' time. You've got two full parliamentary weeks to have the hustings, at which point there could be two candidates emerge. There will be two candidates that emerge, and they're the two that go before the membership. The question then is whether the second-place candidate, if they're really well behind the first-place candidate, will decide to step aside. A former Prime Minister used to party insurrection, urging haste too. In a damning letter, Sir John Major wrote, The proposal for the Prime Minister to remain in office is unwise and may be unsustainable. Some will argue his new cabinet will restrain him. I merely note that his previous cabinet did not or could not do so. The bond of trust between Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party is now fundamentally broken yet he remains in office for weeks, if not months. Jostling to succeed him has already begun, but the manner of his downfall could create a whiplash that results in a very different successor who takes the country in a new direction. An MP who voted Remain and has never served in government, Tom Tugendhat, immediately endorsed by the leader of the moderate wing of the party. I think we need uh, a fresh start. Uh, and in particular, we need to restore trust uh, in governments, not just in, in this government or, the, or a Conservative government, but in the way we do government uh, more widely. And I think having somebody who's not in the Cabinet, uh, which you know, is, is often the follow-up question, well, he's not in the Cabinet, I think that's an advantage. There will be many contenders to be the next Prime Minister, but leadership contests deepen divisions and expose weakness in a party that has already spent months tearing itself apart. Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, let's take a closer look at who the most likely candidates are to replace Boris Johnson. Uh, you just saw a few of them there. So both the former Chancellor Rishi Sunak as well as the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss have both at times been favourites over the last couple of years to be the next Prime Minister. Also among those presumed to be in the running are the former Health Secretaries Sajid Javid and Jeremy Hunt, who's currently Chair of the Health and Social Care committee. And you probably noticed last night the Attorney General, Suella Braverman, confirmed that she would run to become leader, although she's still in post sitting around that cabinet table. Also in the frame would be the current Chancellor and former Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi. But the leading candidate at the moment with the Conservative membership appears to be the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, as I say, the most popular cabinet minister after a poll today amongst Conservative Party members and also as well, it should be added, in public polls. So who will the Conservative Party choose? Well, the MP Caroline Noakes joins me now from Westminster. Good to talk to you, Caroline Noakes. Um, well, I won't ask you for your choice yet, but uh, maybe later. I want to ask you, of course, though, about how quickly it all takes place. Do you have concerns about Boris Johnson remaining as Prime Minister for two or three months? Well, I certainly have concerns about a protracted process, and I would agree with Sir Charles Walker, who is a very experienced parliamentarian, and made the point that MPs have two full sitting weeks of Parliament to go before the summer recess. There is no reason why we couldn't have whittled it down to the final two contenders in those weeks and then go out to a, a membership ballot. This could all be done and dusted within a month. Including the membership ballots. Well, I suppose, you know, if, you, if you're all gathered in Westminster, what, you could have two or three ballots a day. I can see how you can whittle it down to the two candidates. But uh, then don't there have to be hustings and uh, those candidates have to make their pitches to the membership? And last time round, that took, what, six weeks, wasn't it? Well, look, didn't we learn a, a massive amount through the pandemic, what you could achieve via... Uh, via Zoom. And I think that we could do online hustings. I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, perhaps the party could get into the 21st century and have an online ballot so you didn't have to worry about postal ballots being returned. And I think it's really important that we crack on with the process, get this over and done with. We don't need any more dither and delay. We need to have a new leader taking us in a direction towards the next general election whenever that comes.
Uh, and why do you think that? Because I did ask you, do you have concerns about Mr Johnson remaining? I mean, you clearly had concerns about him being Prime Minister. You've been wanting him to go for quite some time. Uh, do you think it's, there's a danger in letting him stay? Well, it feels very unsatisfactory. Previously, when we've had uh, prime ministers who stood down, they've acted in a caretaker role until such time as their successor has been chosen. But they haven't stood down in quite the circumstances that uh, the Boris Johnson has. We saw Theresa May couldn't get her Brexit deal through. We saw David Cameron stand down after the referendum. I think it's really important that we reflect on exactly why it is that members lost trust in Boris Johnson. And I would be very happy to see Dominic Raab, the Deputy Prime Minister, stand uh, in as Prime Minister during the, the interregnum, as it were. Uh, he did a, a fine job when Boris Johnson was in hospital with COVID. And I think he's the sort of safe pair of hands who could steer us through the next few weeks without this sort of cloud and question hanging over him. And, and can I ask you this, Caroline Oaks, about this idea of a caretaker government and uh, it more or less not doing very much uh, and just looking after the shop? Because you're a politician, you know that events often define how politicians react. And, you know, the UK could face, let's say, an economic crisis, the Eurozone, Italy's about to go bankrupt, the Eurozone could blow up. Who knows what President Putin could do? He's often threatening to extend the war beyond the borders of Ukraine. This government may have to make some very big calls with Boris Johnson leading it. Well, look, I think we've seen some good people go into government in the last few hours. Greg Clark, I certainly think, will be an incredibly safe pair of hands at communities. I was pleased to see Rob Buckland go back in. But some important characters, some important individuals, I would particularly highlight Ben Wallace and his job as Defence Secretary. We've had consistency and stability there. So I'm not worried about immediate decisions that have to be taken. I would be worried if this were to drag on for months and months. So I look at October, which seems a very long way away, and I would much prefer us to have this matter settled as quickly as we possibly could and a new prime minister in place to make those big decisions, to make those big calls. And have you signed up to a leadership campaign yet? Well, look, I think that there are a variety of colleagues who are coming out uh, and setting their stalls both publicly and privately. What matters to me is that we have somebody with ability and integrity. We have somebody uh, experienced. I think when you look at some of the challenges that we're facing, uh, particularly when it comes to Ukraine, I think that it would be very helpful to us to have people who had an understanding of defence. I think that really matters. But I also want a safe pair of hands with the economy. But above all else, I want somebody who I can trust to do the right thing, to do, to make the decisions that are in the country's interest. I want somebody who is going to be honest, determined, and is going to set out a really clear vision for where they think the country should be going. Good talking to you, Caroline Oakes. Thank you very much indeed. Well, of course, Boris Johnson famously once said he wanted to be world king. Well, he may not have reached quite that height, but we'll leave office with Britain in a very different place to where it would have been, of course, without him. His role during the pandemic can be contested. His central role in taking the country out of the European Union certainly cannot. Our home editor, Jason Farrell, reflects now on the Prime Minister's legacy. Are we ready? The biggest character in modern British politics. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. <laughs> Who, in beating his way to number 10, this whole debate is about democracy. took the country out of the EU. You must stay at home. In office, he was confronted with one of the deadliest challenges ever faced by any Prime Minister COVID 19. But was the downfall of this great showman? that he simply couldn't survive being seen for who he really was. A liar, a showman, a buffoon, a rank incompetent, and probably the most shameful prime minister that Britain has ever had, and somebody the like of whom I pray we will never see again. Now, I've always liked Boris Johnson. He's got a real earnest concern for the British people, and they feel it. And it's because they feel it that they love him so much. Well, what a tragedy that we've come to this. But we've come to this by his own hand, I'm sorry to say. In a way, this will be, as always, a personal tragedy. You know, the, the very 
many of the factors that brought Boris Johnson to be Prime Minister are also responsible for his fall. Johnson set out in life to be a winner. As a child, his stated ambition was world king and his method, self-belief, even if not everything he said was true. As a journalist, he was sacked from the Times for misrepresentation and in politics was sacked again from his first front bench role for lying about an affair. But with celebrity appeal and a radar for popular policy, he became London's first Conservative mayor, dubbed the Heineken politician, reaching parts other Tories couldn't. Thank you for sticking up for London and for the innocent, hard-working people of this city. So why not reach number 10? Get me a lad. <laughs> Whether he believed in Brexit or not, joining Vote Leave provided a platform and a policy that appealed to many grassroots Tories. And while Theresa May had first stab at delivering Brexit... Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. He convinced the Tories and then the electorate that his so-called oven-ready deal was better. I think that his strength really lay in campaigning. I think had he picked a... A particularly strong team around him and enabled himself to do more of the campaigning while others did more of the governing, I think he might still be in place. His rise had been on the sale of optimism. So his initial approach to the pandemic was the same. I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients and I shook hands with everybody, uh, you'll be pleased to know. Accused of being slow to lock down, he succumbed to the virus. Meanwhile, his controversial advisor, Dominic Cummings, broke the rules. Then, his apparent rivalry with the Prime Minister's new bride, Carrie Johnson, led to him being cut loose, instantly becoming his former boss's fiercest critic. Tens of thousands of people died who didn't need to die. But Johnson had got Brexit done, albeit with stored-up problems in Northern Ireland. His next success was on the vaccine rollout. It was world-beating, far faster than the EU. He'd won an 80-seat majority and he'd been quick to support Ukraine against aggression from Russia. And for those reasons, supporters forgave his failings for as long as they could. His initial support for Owen Paterson, who was guilty of lobbying while accepting cash, the donor-funded refurbishment of his flat above number 11, the number 10 parties during lockdown and the inconsistencies over what the Prime Minister knew. Nobody said to me, this is an event that is against the rules. Still, a police investigation fined him for breaching his own laws. He thought he could play it all as he has all his life, ever since he was a schoolboy at Eton. He thought he could do it his own way, and he found out, and, and many, many people said from the very beginning uh, that it would go wrong. The question was only when. When Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher stood down after allegations of sexual harassment, it emerged the PM had been warned of previous behaviour. He denied knowing, then, when it was clear he did, said he'd forgotten. His Chancellor and Health Secretary had had enough and set in chain a crumbling of his support. When you're choosing any leader, there are uncertainties. You don't know how things will turn out. There is, there is risk in every instance, but he did deliver... Brexit, as he promised, he did deliver election victory as well. And, and as I've said, there are significant achievements during his premiership. It, despite, you know, the, you know, the, the very negative circumstances of, of recent weeks. The man who could reach the parts others couldn't was plunging to the depths, pulling his party with him. It took a damagingly long time for them and him to let go. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Now, a couple of illustrations of just uh, how quickly Boris Johnson is cracking on with forming his new government. A couple more ministerial appointments to tell you about. First of all, Johnny Mercer has been uh, appointed Minister for Veterans Affairs, former soldier, of course, Johnny Mercer, long campaigned on those issues. He will attend Cabinet, we are hearing. And an illustration, if anyone needed it, just what an extraordinary week this has been, because Will Quince is back in government, I think, after about, what, three days out of it, uh, back in uh, as uh, a minister at the Department of Education. Now, you remember Will Quince 
on Monday, how long ago that seems, on Monday was sent out to defend the Prime Minister over the Chris Pincher affair and uh, was briefed by Downing Street. Uh, he said in his resignation letter that he felt he'd been misled by Number 10 Downing Street and then that whole ball started rolling. Well, Will Quince is uh, back there in the Department of Education as a Minister of State. Well, to the economy now, and Boris Johnson told his cabinet today he wouldn't make any major changes to policy or big fiscal decisions. Now, the backdrop for his final days or weeks in power will be the same as that for whoever succeeds him. Of course, a cost of living crisis and a premiership which saw the highest increase in public debt of any modern prime minister. Our data and economics editor, Ed Conway, analyses the economic challenges now facing the government. So now we have more of a sense of what's going on with the politics, but what about the economics? Well, here, there's a couple of things to look at. First of all, how do people view the UK uh, as an investment? Now, you can get a sense of that by looking at what's going on in currency markets. Remember during Brexit, how it was kind of going around up and down, depending on what was going on with that roller coaster. Well, here, the funny thing is, it was moderately stable in the last few days. Really weak, the pound, right now, against most other currencies. But it didn't seem to be moving until we got that news uh, that Boris Johnson was going to resign. When that news broke, just look at what happened to sterling against the dollar. It shot up, and now it is a fair bit stronger than it was before. So there's a bit of kind of st stability premium there. People relieved that we know a little bit more about what's going to happen now. But, of course, the big question is, what are they going to do about economic policy? What can they do? And one of the big things they want to address is this. Both the Chancellor, the new Chancellor, and indeed Boris Johnson have talked a lot about the tax burden and the fact that it is getting up to the highest level that we've seen since the 1940s. That's the rate at which we pay tax, basically, as a percentage of GDP. And look at how high that's going up. But here's the issue. They want to cut that, but for some people, the pressure might be in the other direction. The Office of Budget Responsibility, they're the people, the government's kind of official forecasters, they produced this bit of analysis just now, looking at the change in long-term deficit as a result of things happening recently. So basically, the higher these bars are, the more the deficit's going to go up. You can see the fiscal position, actually, that's improved a bit recently, but look over to the other side. So demography's a bit worse, so fewer people being born, so less people to, to pay taxes. Net zero, the cost of net zero means that fewer taxes are coming in, petrol taxes, uh, and then you've got social care uh, and other factors as well. And you stack all of that up and you're talking about quite a lot of extra costs. In fact, about £37 billion worth. If you wanted to get net debt, so the total national debt, down to the levels it was before the pandemic, you need to raise taxes by £37 billion, not cut them, and that is a lot. So that's one concern uh, for the Prime Minister, leaving aside whether he's actually able to pass any uh, of his legislation. But overshadowing everything, is this, inflation. This shows you the inflation rate across the G7, so major economies around the world. Everyone thought that we had tamed it, that it was going to be low forever, and look at what happened. It has risen to the highest level that we've seen since the early 1980s, and the UK, that red line, is the highest of all. So it's that cost of living crisis that is going to remain the big economic challenge in the next few months. Ed Conway there. Well, now, before he was Prime Minister, Boris Johnson was, of course, no stranger on the world stage, having served as Foreign Secretary under his predecessor. Recently, it was in that realm that Mr Johnson found refuge from troubles here at home. He immersed himself in the diplomacy surrounding the war in Ukraine, a major player in the European push to support President Zelensky. But it was fraught relations with the European Union that will leave many on the continent now glad to see the back of him. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, looks at Boris Johnson's international legacy. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a key ally, announces that he is resigning. Johnson to the Americans, a key ally. To the Germans, a scandal noodle or glutton for scandal. Whatever they called the Prime Minister, his spectacular demise has seized the world's attention. <laughs> From the start, he was a different kind of statesman. For some, a refreshing change of character. For others, reason to pity Britain. For European allies, the way he's pursued Brexit has been a constant cause of frustration and anger. The fact is that uh, the, under Boris Johnson, the British government could not be relied upon. Or, or I would say it could be relied upon to be unreliable. He was, to critics, too deferential to Donald Trump, who called him a British version of himself. You know this is, as everybody knows, it's going to be a fantastic prime minister, I can tell you. 
but he maintained close relations with his successor too, on Ukraine in particular. But viewed from the other side of the Atlantic, his scandal-prone time in office has ultimately not been good for Britain's place in the world. He's very intelligent, he's extremely engaging, but as a political leader, he's also been deeply narcissistic and hasn't been good for the United Kingdom. And so even if the Americans miss him, we have to recognize that this has been a bad period for UK politics. It has been beset with scandal upon scandal upon scandal. Boris Johnson has been caught in lie after lie after lie, and they don't need this. Not so in Ukraine, though, where he was one of the first leaders to visit after the war began. He's seen as the most dependable of allies in government and on the street, where they reacted with regret to the news of his resignation. We are sad because of it. We seen him come here in Kyiv. I think it's a big mistake for Ukraine because it's Boris Johnson is our big friend. Not surprisingly, Johnson's legacy on Ukraine is a part of his record one favourite to succeed him wants to preserve. He has led from the front on Ukraine, as he had on Covid and obviously Brexit, and I think that isn't lost on many people, but the whole of the political system is supportive of what we're doing in Ukraine. I don't expect that to finish at all. Most recently, Boris Johnson seemed more at ease on the world stage, away from his troubles back home and like other leaders before him, may well be remembered more fondly abroad than at home. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Well, now we can speak to the former chair of the Brexit Select Committee, Labour's Hilary Benn. Good to talk to you, Mr Benn. Now, uh, Good evening, earlier Dermot. today, uh, your leader, Keir Starmer, described this as uh, a government that uh, wasn't functioning. Does it seem now that the engines are firing up again? We've got a, a new cabinet they met this afternoon and uh, a continuing slew of ministerial appointments. Well, the jobs are clearly being filled after the extraordinary events of the last few days. I mean, it was inevitable that his premiership was held below the waterline. And finally, he he bowed to that inevitability. But listening to his speech today, there was no self-awareness, no self-criticism. And he was, I think he blamed the Westminster herd for not understanding what a what a wonderful prime minister he was. I think... His premiership will be looked at as bad for Britain, bad in the world, as, as we've just been reporting. And there was a very telling comment in your earlier package where your reporter said whether he believed it or not. And I think Brexit is a really good example because, as you know, Dermot, he very famously wrote two articles, one in favour of staying in the European Union and one in favour of leaving and decided to publish the latter. And I think he probably thought, We'll lose the referendum, but I will position myself well to become the next leader of the Conservative Party. And I think the only thing Boris Johnson has really believed in is himself. Uh, and I'm relieved well, that he has got... Okay. I mean, just while we're on that subject, and given the yeah. uh, long discussions uh, you and I used to have during those um, uh, Brexit years, if I can term them that, since 2016, can I take it, though, now that Labour is now endorsing Boris Johnson's approach to Brexit after that speech by Keir Starmer last week, uh, saying that uh, Labour does not now support rejoining the single market, the customs union, certainly not uh, the European Union, and that then, therefore, I suppose, a few tweaks to the Northern Ireland Protocol and you'd be in lockstep? No, we're not in lockstep. I mean, I haven't changed my mind about Brexit. I think it was a profound mistake, and we are now seeing the economic consequences. In the modern world, the best way to exercise your sovereignty is in partnership with others to defend and advance the interests of your people. That is a fundamental truth of international affairs at the beginning of the 21st century. But look, he's made a terrible hash of the Northern Ireland Protocol. We desperately need to get this sorted because there is no functioning government in Northern Ireland and the government has got to change tag. But so has the Commission. And I've been critical of the Commission. I've said to them, you have got to move because this is a political problem that requires a political solution. No, I think what Keir said was very simply to recognise a fact. And the fact is we have left. I don't think there is a public appetite to have another referendum which would be required to rejoin the single market, in my view, the customs union or the EU, and that isn't going to happen. And we need to turn our attention to the new question, which is how do we build a new but different relationship 
with our European friends and neighbours. We've got to make right. trade easier. We've got to deal with the bureaucracy and red tape that Boris Johnson's deal has dumped on the heads of British business. But that isn't going to I happen. Can't. OK. While the Northern Ireland Protocol is a bone of contention and we need a different approach to that to get it sorted, it's perfectly doable. And but you need the right politics. OK, and Mr Ben, can I just ask you specifically then, has Labour's threat, now that Boris Johnson has announced his resignation, of course he hasn't gone yet, but that, that threat from Labour to call a vote of no confidence in the House, that's, that's gone away. You'll, you'll settle for the process taking place within the Conservative Party. Well, I am, I am but a humble backbencher these days, and that's a question you ought to direct to the Labour front bench. I think uh, maybe the Conservative Party will decide they need as quick a process as possible of electing a new leader and therefore a new prime minister because I think everybody and Conservative MPs, the rest of the country have had enough of Boris Johnson. We've also had enough of 12 years of Conservative government and those Tory MPs who put him in his job knowing exactly what he was like, they can't now say, oh, well, we argued for him to be removed. They were complicit in everything that he did and we need a change and I hope that will come soon. So do you get a sense then that, I mean, you hope to pin this around the Conservative party, party when you do fight them at the next general election, Boris Johnson's legacy. They, of course, will want a, a clean skin, a new leader uh, with uh, maybe a bit of uh, a new appointment bounce and presumably go to the country, one would imagine, sometime next year. Well, that's a very interesting question, Dermot, because whoever becomes Prime Minister will inherit a majority of 80 and he or she will probably wish to be pretty sure that they could do better than that before they take the risk on a general election. Remember, the last Conservative Prime Minister who tried that lost her majority altogether. Look, whenever the election comes, we're going to be ready to fight it under Keir Starmer, the new leadership, the new direction. And I, I think we're approaching the moment where after 12 years, remember, you know, long waiting lists to see the GP, queues to get your operations done, concerns about security, the need to get the economy moving. These are all reasons why I hope the British people will look at Labour and say, you know what, it is now time for a change and I can't wait for that moment to arrive. We have to win people's trust and confidence, but we're ready to do our best to achieve that. And isn't, isn't one of the problems with that, Mr Ben, is that you say, yes, 12 years' time for a change. It's a very potent, as we all know, political slogan, wherever it's deployed around the world. But um, the problem is that uh, this Conservative Party, with its variety of leaders during the 12 years it's been in power, continues, therefore, to reinvent itself. And one of Boris Johnson's biggest tricks, if I could call it that, was to more or less say to the British public that this is an entirely new government and had nothing to do with the previous austerity one. Well, he, he did. And uh, I mean, the, the contradiction at the heart of the Conservative Party and the Conservative government, which we will see play out in the leadership election, is on the one hand, they all stand up and say, we are low taxing Conservatives. And on the other hand, we've got a huge tax burden at the moment on the British people. And they're going to have to decide how they reconcile the two. But after the years of uh, George Osborne and David Cameron's austerity, I don't think there's any appetite for that. We are going into a really difficult winter for so many people in this country, worried about bills, rising food prices, and they will be looking to see, have we got a government that's on our side or not? And that is where the fight will be held whenever the election yeah, yeah. comes, because in tough times, people look to the government to help them. And okay. we stand ready to, to rise to that challenge if we're given the opportunity. Very good talking to you, as always, Mr Ben. Thank you very and much you. indeed there. Labour's Hillary Ben there. Well, it was the so-called red wall that propelled Boris Johnson to a seemingly unassailable position, as we were mentioning there, in 2019. The once Labour heartlands where many voters turned to the Conservatives, partly on a promise of getting Brexit done, and delivered the Prime Minister an 80-seat majority, no less. So have the recent scandals over Partygate and Pincher seen those voters turn away? Or will they miss Boris Johnson? The Sky's Katerina Vitozzi has been to Bolton to hear the Red Wall reaction there to the Prime Minister's demise. This is 96.5 Bolton FM. Boris Johnson has resigned as Prime Minister after less than three years in office. It was constituencies like Bolton North East in Greater Manchester that got Boris Johnson into power. 
part of the so-called Labour Red Wall that in 2019 turned blue. When you come to a constituency like this one, which turned Conservative for the first time in decades back in 2019, and you ask people, why did you vote Conservative? You'll often hear three things. First, that they believed what the Conservative Party was saying about Brexit, then about levelling up. But really, it's because people say they liked Boris Johnson. And that inspired some people to vote Conservative for the very first time. Hello. Like Anne Griffiths, who lives at a very different number 10, with her bulldog, Winston. He was a big character and he said what he felt. Sometimes it was wrong, maybe it wasn't politically correct. Who gives a damn? I still think he cares passionately about England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. And do you believe there is anyone else within the Conservative Party that would persuade you to vote for the party again? No. Quite simply, no. And the reason I have fought so hard in the last few days... And the loss of those votes could be significant. The Tory MP here won in 2019 by the slimmest of margins. His supporters fear he wouldn't win again. I'm very disappointed because um, I think the Red Ball... Um, constituencies are just going to go back to being Labour because uh, Boris brought the Red Wall down and he got, he got their attention and they wanted him. Working class people actually wanted to vote Conservative for the first time. I think that's lost now. How did you feel seeing the resignation speech today? It was a bit of a sweet moment. I think people have expected it for a long time. Will Bruce has always voted Labour, but today, for him, it didn't feel like a day to celebrate. I think he needs to go now. I think they need to actually have a, cha a real change of leadership so that basically we can actually kind of deal with the issues of the country that are being, like, with inflation and fuel crisis, especially in a poor working class town like Bolton. This is a place with many social challenges. For some, the Prime Minister's resignation feels like a relief. Since the Prime Minister was found to have breached the rules he set up himself, I think he should have gone. Really, I don't know why they kept him there. He was just a lame duck, more or, more or less, really. It's a bit of hope now that somebody else could be there, that we have a new team that is going to give people hope and uh, more confidence. For the Conservative Party, the pressure is now on to find a leader who can make sure that votes lent in 2019 return next time. Catherine Fatotzi, Sky News in Bolton. Well, joining me now is Camilla Cavendish, the former director of the Number 10 Policy Unit for David Cameron, now a member of the House of Lords. Very good to see you and uh, welcome back to Downing Street. I'm sure you've been back since then. Let me put the same question, more or less, that I put to Hillary Benn, because Labour termed this government over the last few days as a not functioning one. You also felt that that was happening. I mean, it has been an extraordinary few days. Yes. Does it feel, though, now like it is beginning to function again? We've got a new cabinet, new ministerial appointments and the same prime minister. Yes, so you're beginning to get the vacancies filled. I mean, there was one point this morning, I think, when we had nobody in the Department of Education uh, running schools. Um, so, in principle, there are posts that are filled, there is a manifesto, there is legislation still going through Parliament. Um, however, I think I've felt for quite a few months that the government hasn't really been functioning very well under Boris Johnson because fundamentally he came to power as a revolutionary and a great campaigner and he has never quite figured out how to govern. Why do you think that happened? Why did he lose his oomph, his desire to shake things up, as we saw, of course, during the referendum campaign? I think he has never taken the time to understand execution and really care about policy detail. I mean, I'm a policy wonk, I happen to care about these things, but the truth is, you can be mayor of London, you can be a star and an entertainer and have great political instincts, which he did. You can't be prime minister in this building unless you're prepared to work hours and hours of the day and read all of your briefs and think very, very deeply about really quite detailed areas. You're probably taking 20, 25 decisions a day. OK, but isn't it about the people you put around you and listening to them? Because Boris Johnson brought a lot of people, a lot of people who'd worked so effectively with him as Mayor of London. OK, different running a country, yep. but you put the good people around you, but you've got to listen to them, haven't you? Because I want to put to you that, remember, I used to stand out here when David Cameron was in there and say, well, he's got a bit of a reputation for chillaxing, yes. you know, and he's perhaps not entirely engaged at all times. But it's the people around you. Off. 
but we would put the red boxes together at 10 o'clock at night and by 8 o'clock in the morning we would come here and we would have the meeting and he would have gone through every single one of those papers and he would have made decisions. And that's what a good Prime Minister does. Um, you can have great people around you, but you've got to set a clear direction. I think one of Boris Johnson's flaws has been he likes to be liked, he finds it very hard to make difficult trade-offs. And I think a lot of people have felt he's been only as good as the last person he talked to, changed his mind very, very often. And out, right out the rest of Whitehall, there are thousands of people who work here and they need clarity. And we have not had that, really, for three years. And then now this weird transition from active Prime Minister to caretaker yes. Prime Minister. You know, there may be some big calls, as I was saying earlier, to make, whether you like them or not. Yes. How um, does he handle that? Well, David Cameron did stay on. We stayed on for a while until Theresa May came on. He was very careful not to bind the hands of our successor. He held off a lot of policy announcements that we've been planning to make. Um, but you do still have the levers of power. And I do think that what Sir John Major said earlier today that it might be unwise to let Boris Johnson be the caretaker because he hasn't actually got the confidence of the House of Commons was probably true. So you are in the camp that said there should be an interim Prime Minister, a Dominic Raab has been mentioned. I think you need a Dominic Raab type character who is not going to stand for the leadership but who can keep the machine running and be a respected caretaker. Let me, talk, simpler. let me talk to you about this loss of authority. So there's a loss of authority in this country. There's an even bigger one internationally where, let's say, relations with so many countries has been pretty fraught, to say the very least. Aren't they now just going to, I mean, ignore him altogether? We, we know you're going. We don't need to deal with you. Well, that's true. Once you stand there and give the speech he gave this morning, the power drains out of the building. And, yeah, the world leaders stop calling on the whole um, because everybody knows this happens in every country. Um, you're a dead man walking at that point. And the Tories have to get on and have a swift leadership contest and install somebody who can take the party forward and take and the country forward. Let's talk about, uh, unless you want to name some names, let's talk about uh, the character of who should replace him. Certainly someone, I'm imagining you're going to tell me, with a firm grasp of ethics. Uh, what else, though, is required when it comes to repairing those international relations and, of course, dealing with, I was going to say, looming economic crisis, the economic crisis we're in right here and now? Yes. I mean, I think the backdrop is really different to the backdrop we had before the referendum. I mean, as you say, we have economic crisis, we have the pound, sterling is sliding and sliding, inflation is up. Um, Britain is in a very dangerous situation and I think that actually the party needs to put aside its differences over Brexit right now there are candidates trying to establish their tax crutching credentials because they think that will get them elected with the right of the party or there are candidates saying you know they don't want to vote for anybody who stood for Remain. I think they need to get past that and look at the new economic context and have a sensible program for economic growth which can command confidence of business and investors and indeed the rest of the world. And I don't think that's impossible to do, by the way. So, I mean, i.e. very, very serious indeed. We need a bit, a bit of John Major feel about it then, is it? Yes, perhaps. I mean, when um, Nadim Zahawi decided to take the chancellorship, I thought he was seeing himself as the John Major character who came in and became the Prime Minister, actually, with, with quite a good background, but nobody quite knew who it was. Um, I'm afraid I fear that having then immediately written on Treasury letterhead to the Prime Minister asking him to go uh, was too opportunistic, really, for him to be the John Major character. But, but as you're suggesting, I think, I don't think the next person needs to be a hugely dramatic charismatic entertainer. I think we've had quite enough of that. Uh, we need somebody who is sober and serious and grown up and preferably has ministerial experience and preferably has not served in the Johnson cabinet and had to defend the indefensible for ah, so many years. Well, that disqualifies so many of the front runners. I mean, I was going to you know, mention, you mentioned there's somebody who has to get over leave remain. Well, Ben Wallace is the front runner. He, of course, was a remainer, but is incredibly popular with the general Conservative electorate. But you think he's, he's been there too long, his hands are dirtied? I think the general Conservative electorate is a very small number of people. Um, I think this decision needs to be made by the Parliamentary Party, who probably have a better sense of what will play in the country. Um, I'm not saying a lot of these people, like Ben Wallace, aren't admirable people, but what I'm saying is I think, apart from Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, who at least had the courage to resign, and Sajid Javid, remember, has resigned twice, I think anybody who stayed in the Cabinet beyond Monday, I'm afraid, is really tarnished. Because what the next man or woman has to do is not just craft an economic policy, but re-establish our faith in politics as a country. 
that is a really big ask, and you have to start with that above everything else. And just in terms of the speed of this process, what's your, your take on it? Because, you know, when the, David Cameron was replaced, in the end it didn't go to the Conservative uh, membership because there was a deal done. The, right. the, the, the party whittled it down to two, Andrea Leadsom and Theresa May, and in the end a deal was done and there was only Theresa May, so yes. she just had to be endorsed. Yes, and I think that would be quite a good thing. I think at the moment the danger is that half the MPs who come on your show seem to suddenly declare that they're standing for the leadership. Um, and we could be seeing hundreds of these people in a contest which is not really helpful. I think there are, we all know who the grown-ups are. Uh, there's only a handful of them. And I think the MPs would be better to try and unite around somebody. Um, not to rush it, because it does need to be a thought-out decision, but really try and unite around, if not one person, at least two that they can then decide between. And what would your thoughts be then on a new leader? There is going to be one, certainly by the, the autumn, before the party conference at the very latest, on this issue. It's always asked. A new leader hasn't stood as leader before the, the general electorate. What about a general election then next spring, something like that, for validation? I mean, in a democracy, that's the right answer, isn't it? Because yeah. essentially we've had a number of prime ministers now who have actually come into office uh, without that general election and without that confirmation. Um, I don't think it's cut and dried, though, because I really do think this country is in a national crisis. I mean, we are at war with... Well, we are in a war with Ukraine. We have a cost-of-living crisis. We have inflation. We have, I mean, I, I, I think um, the right person, if they've said, look, I actually really think I've got a plan here and I need to have some time to execute it, I think that would equally be fine. Um, and the Labour Party obviously has not... Uh, itself pushed for a general election, um, which would have been the democratic alternative. That's but we shall see. Camilla Cavendish, really good talking to you. Baroness Cavendish, thank you very much indeed, former head of the policy unit here at number 10 with David Cameron. Well, uh, of course, uh, we are changing prime ministers uh, once again, eventually. Uh, what another dramatic day it has been. Boris Johnson uh, coming out to announce his, his resignation about uh, six or seven hours ago, uh, a few metres away from here. Sorry, yards, uh, Mr Johnson. And now the race is on to replace him. Uh, there he was, watched uh, by, amongst others, his wife. The race is on to replace him. We will be taking you through the runners and riders. <laughs>